everyone, it's Allie, and these are my two kittens. Ivory is the white one, and this is Libre. He's the all-black cat, and those are my little guys. And they really wanted to get on camera today, so I thought I would start my uh, lecture off with them. And students generally like to see my cats in lectures or on Zoom. So anyway, it's Allie, and um, this week in our class, we're in the 1980s, and we're moving into the 1990s uh, slightly. And for this week's video lecture, I'm going to focus on NBC. And in the 1980s, NBC, led by Brandon Tartikoff, rises to the top of the network battle. And we've been um, watching how the big three, ABC, CBS, and NBC, have been battling since television's debut, trying to have that top spot. And Tartikoff, um, he kind of has that magic here with NBC during this decade and what he does to um, make NBC become the big network of the decade is one of the strategies that he employs is called the slow growth strategy. And there's one particular um, sitcom that really benefits from this strategy significantly. And that's a sitcom that goes on to become known as one of the finest of the genre. And again, this may not have even had a chance to build the audience to become so well known and to still have uh, the kind of significance it does in American culture um, and on streaming services. People still watch this at a high degree and um, that is Seinfeld. So Seinfeld didn't have a, a good um, audience when it first debuted, but the critics really liked it. And so Tartikoff decided to replay episodes in the summer months and to try to garner an audience from those as the new season debuted. And this slow growth um, approach really works for NBC and other networks take note and also start employing this strategy. There's a show that I really like during this time period called Northern Exposure, and that's a CBS vehicle, but um, that is uh, another show that had really good critical reviews, but it didn't gather um, a significant audience for a couple of years in, into its uh, showing. And so there's some really critical uh, moves here in the 1980s, and one of the reasons that these kinds of strategies are being employed is because, of course, as we've been looking at in the last couple of weeks in our class, in the 1980s, we don't just have the big three and PBS the way that it had been. Of course, we had DuMont in the 50s, but um, by the 60s and 70s, we really just had the big three and PBS. But here in the 1980s, we've been starting to look at how cable television has debuted, and these emerging cable channels are now competing with the big three. And so... Uh, what happens with NBC, CBS, and ABC is that they need to compete with cable television and they have to make a fine product to do so. So we start getting different strategies such as this slow grow technique and we start to see critically acclaimed shows be championed. They can compete with what's available on cable and still bring in viewers. And NBC does this the best during the 1980s. Um, there's one show we're going to look at in particular this week, and this is a show that really paves the way for success for other shows, especially other shows that present a minority viewpoint. And that is a blockbuster that is called The Cosby Show. And I know everyone has um, heard of The Cosby Show. I'm sure most people, even, even today, when we're starting to get into the 2020s, we're a little bit farther removed from the 1980s. This is a show that most people have seen in syndication um, at some degree or another. Um, we're also going to have our reflection essay this week. It's going to deal with the Cosby show and with the legacy. So there's been, um, in the last few years, I think most of you are aware, there has been um, allegations thrown at Bill Cosby in regards to sexual assault. And we will read an article that uh, looks at 35 different women and their experiences with Bill Cosby. And um, although he has now been released from prison on a technicality, he had been convicted and did start to serve a sentence. And so um, how does the allegations against Bill Cosby impact 
this family-friendly sitcom from the 1980s and the legacy that it um, had already established prior to this happening. Um, I will say as a television instructor, it's more difficult to find uh, copies of The Cosby Show than it used to be. Um, it's, it's become a little bit more difficult to watch the show itself, and I don't think it's as uh, readily you know, available as it used to be. It's still there, and I can find clips and um, screenings for us, but that is one thing that I've noticed. Um, also, it's not... Uh, the content of The Cosby Show with that family-friendly vibe with um, Dr. Huxtable and imparting life wisdom does impact the way that viewers are interacting with the show now with these um, unsavory allegations. Where if it was a different type of television program, if the character that um, Bill Cosby was playing was not you know, an all-American father, perhaps there'd be a different um, situation going on societally with how uh, it is perceived. So what I'm asking you to do this week in our reflection essay is to tell me what you think, not not to uh, tell me what I tell you or what um, you've noticed other people, but I want you to really grapple with this. And uh, I did put up a trigger warning this week for survivors of sexual assault. Some of this will be heavy content. If you um, are struggling with this, if it is triggering uh, personal um, situations, please, please contact me and we can find an alternative assignment. Um, for some people looking at aspects like this from the, from their own, um, that match up with their own personal experiences helps. For others, it doesn't. And so I don't want to reopen old wounds as we look at something that is uh, pretty significant. So, um, Again, we're looking at The Cosby Show kind of in two different ways this week. So in that reflection essay, we're going to look at the legacy and how uh, these allegations against Bill Cosby have um, impacted that. And again, he is not in prison. He was released on a technicality, but he had been convicted and had started um, to serve a sentence. And so that is a little bit different than um, just the allegations. So how, how do you feel about that? Is... Um, being released on a technicality, does that uh, clear everything up for you? Or are you still slightly troubled? And I'm also going to have us um, make a reference or a direct quote to the article that I'm sharing along with the reflection essay. And the reason for that is we're starting to get um, towards our final papers here. And I just like a little practice for everyone using a source um, in that kind of way that we will in the um, final papers. Um, we're also going to look at The Cosby Show and the success that it had within the 1980s and the impact that it makes. And like I said, uh, this was a huge blockbuster show. And by blockbuster, what I mean by that is basically everyone was tuning in. And they were tuning in for Cosby, and then it started to uh, increase the level of black television that we get in this era and after it. And so Cosby really paves the way for this black aesthetic on television, and it was appealing to people across demographics. So black families were watching The Cosby Show, but so were white families. And um, in The Cosby Show really presents a black family as an all-American family. And so this is a very well-to-do family. Um, the Both the parents are professionals, the children um, end up usually going to college. The expectations are that they will go to college and they um, traditionally go to historic uh, black colleges and universities. So there is a very strong black aesthetic within the Cosby Show. However, it is also sometimes subtle. Uh, when you go into Theo, the teenage son's room, which isn't an everyday Cosby affair, but on occasion we get to see the um, children's spaces as well as the regular family spaces and uh, in Theo's room he has um, images of black power. Uh, Nelson Mandela is a, a poster that's in his room and he is celebrating like blackness in um, culture through his choices in his room. We also see this at a little more of a subtle level throughout the Cosby house. There are paintings and um, fine art throughout this uh, middle-class home that we see without too much discussion of it, although there is a whole episode, I think it's in season two, where 
they talk about one of the paintings and it's um, created by a black artist that was a uh, part of the family. And so they do go into it at times. They also are um, champions of black art and music. They often go to see um, performances by well-known black uh, dancers or um, jazz is prominent throughout the show as well. And so there is a celebration of black excellence within the Cosby show. However, during the 1980s, critics sometimes slammed the show for only showing this upper class or middle class depiction of black life. And this is during a time in the 1980s where um, societally black people are tending to struggle. And um, this is a time period of joblessness, homelessness is increasing, and um, many people from the black community are struggling at a higher rate than white people. And so critics were saying, why aren't we getting to see the whole picture of black America on this show? Why are we seeing black America glossed over and presented as um, this successful situation like we're seeing on Cosby? And uh, one of the answers to that by um, people affiliated with the shows is you can't show every version of black America on one program. We've chosen this pro this uh this aesthetic, this family to explore, and we're doing it as well as we can. And that's something to really think about. So if there had been other black shows at this time showing a differing um, experience, would the Cosby show have gotten that kind of flack? And I'm going to put it out there that I think it's absolutely revolutionary in the 1980s for the all-American family to be presented as a black family. And so to me, that's um, one of the successes that the Cosby Show does. It doesn't shy away from it. It doesn't make excuses. It just presents this family in the sitcom world as being just like the other families, as worthy, as family-friendly. Um, they have problems, but they're solved in 29 minutes, just like all the other sitcoms. And so in some ways... At this time period, it's a, a much different time in the 1980s, um, even the early 1990s, than it is today. That would be my assertion. So what we see here is the success that Cosby Show um, generates really does pave the way for other black shows, not just on NBC, but across the networks. And um, one of my favorites of uh, this, a little bit later than the Cosby Show, debuts in the 90s is The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. So would Will Smith, who goes on to have, you know, an award-winning um, movie career, had ever gotten, would he have ever gotten a, a, a chance if not for the success of The Cosby Show? Would they have let The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air even air? That's a really good question to ask. And um, I think that the success of The Cosby Show really did, um, pave that avenue of success for other black programs. Um, so we see these on other channels as well. I don't want you to think that this um, black aesthetic is just happening on NBC in this time period. Um, even ABC uh, has a show called Hanging with Mr. Cooper, and Mr. Cooper is a basketball coach and a teacher. And again, um, we hadn't seen that many educators that were uh, African-American until this time period being presented um, as that, uh, you know, much like the Cosby family, all American, Mr. Mr. Hanging with Mr. Cooper is doing a similar thing, showing that yes, black educators are here, black educators are great, their students like them, they are, the diversified workforce is starting to appear on American television. Um, another show uh, starts out on ABC and then it ends up moving to CBS and this ends up being the longest black family on television and that's a show called Family Matters that stars Jaleel White as Steve Urkel and this is a show that um, still has pop culture appeal. Uh, many students that I have um, each semester are still very familiar um, with this show and it's still heavy, heavily aired in um, syndication. And then Something that surprises a lot of students, and there's some readings about this on our course canvas page, is Fox. Fox really embraces this black aesthetic at this time period. And um, they, Fox is a 
burgeoning new network. It's not on cable television. It's the fourth network. And again, we studied DuMont in the 1950s. And until that time period, it was just the big three plus PBS. But then Fox uh, debuts. And of course, one of the um, shows that Fox really uses to become a prominent um, prominent part of American culture is The Simpsons, which is still airing to this day. But at this time period, they also really understood that the black demographic was very underserved. They saw the success with The Cosby Show and tried to replicate it with other shows featuring a black aesthetic. There's, these are also very um, black shows with black writers, black producers, black actors. And um, one of them is a sketch comedy show that I really, really liked at this time period called Living Color. And that stars a young Jim Carrey along with the Wayne brothers. Again, many people from that show go on to um, success in the industry. There's also a show called Martin starring Martin Lawrence. Uh, a show called Rock, which stars Charles S. Dutton, and he goes on to a successful film career as well. And then there's a show called Living Single, and um, we'll watch uh, clips of that this week. And this is a show that people still are really familiar with. It stars Queen Lativa. And um, when I teach this uh, class in person and I do this lecture, there's two times where songs often break out while I'm... Um, doing my lecture and that's when I mention the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air sometimes the theme song is sung and Living Single often has that same effect especially on um, some females in the class so uh, these are shows that although they aired in the 1990s we're starting to get a lot closer to our time period in the 2020s and these are still readily available um, they still culturally um, work when you watch them it, they still match up and people uh, really do appreciate some of these shows so you're going to have a bit of familiarity with some of the shows that we study this week um, we're also going to look at a spin-off of um, the the Cosby show and um, we're going to look at the LA riots and so um, the LA riots end up happening in 1992 and I'm just going to quickly kind of um, briefly wrap up what occurs and so in 1991 there's a guy named Rodney King and I'm sure most of you have heard of Rodney King uh, he ends up being brutally beaten by the LA police and um, these kinds of incidences had happened in the past However, in 1991, people were starting to have uh, cameras available. It wasn't like it is in the 2020s where everyone has a cell phone with a camera attached. However, um, people were starting to have, um, you know, small portable camera devices. And they would, that they would uh, be able to capture footage that had previously only been a, uh, able to be um, caught by professionals. And this happened... On the night that Rodney King was beat a person caught the footage on their camera and released this footage to news and it became one of the first viral videos of police brutality against a black man and America was pretty darn outraged at what they saw they saw an unarmed uh, man being brutally beaten and we'll we ha we'll have footage of um, these events and um, We've seen how in the recent years with the Black Lives Matter movement, there's been um, many George Floyd in Minneapolis, in my hometown of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, there's a young man, he was just a teenager, Tony Robinson, unarmed, shot by police and killed. And so we have a litany of names and we have the same circumstance occurring where we're seeing black men and sometimes black women, Breonna Taylor comes to mind, but uh, black people are being beat up and or murdered by police. And again, this was one of the first times this was uh, caught on camera in 1991. And when the officers were put on trial in 1992, they are acquitted. And um, that this happens in late april i believe it's april 29th through may 4th is when the la riots uh run in 1992 
And so it's a few days. Over 50 people are killed, over $50 million worth of damages. And this is a racially charged riot that breaks out after the white officers who had been put on trial in a primarily white suburb instead of in the city proper were acquitted. And when the news um, erupts, the city uh, really erupts in violence. And so we'll watch some of that. And um, again, these are uh, pretty charged images. And in the time period that we're in today with this um, Black Lives Matters movement, I wish that we could say how much things had changed since 1991. I wish that I could uh, turn to my students and say this type of police violence does not occur the way that it did in the 1990s. And I can't. I'm, I'm really sorry to, to have to say that and to admit it. But we have some serious problems um, with racial violence and the way that law enforcement uh, chooses to deal with uh, minority people in this country. And we still have this problem. And when we visit uh, this situation with the LA riots here in our, our class this week, I know that it's going to be framed from the 90s. But take some time to compare it to um, the Black Lives Matter movement that has uh, happened here in the last couple of years and um, how you think about this and where changes, I think, systematically could start to occur. So again, these are really places where um, television is influencing society, where imagery that's televised, like the Rodney King beating, it was um, caught on a camera, shown to news outlets and then broadcast around the world on television. This influences what actually happens in society. And so we're seeing um, two, two very different things. And again, as a TV scholar, what I'm gonna wrap up here is um, as the LA riots are being aired and broadcast, it's the very same time that the Cosby Show airs its final episode. And so America gets to say goodbye to this classic, all-American, upper-class, well-established, well-respected black family, the Cosby Show. And as they're doing that, there's a racially charged riot happening. And so some Americans literally got split screens of this, where they had like the interrupted uh, broadcast where they would show like up in the corner what was happening in the riots as um, the we're saying goodbye to this all American black family. Other other people, depending on um, what where your uh, you were viewing from, how your station dealt with this, didn't get literal split screen um, views, but they were showed like the Cosby Show, and then they'd go to the news right after. So it was a very similar effect. And so as a um, TV instructor, it's hard not to notice that. Uh, confluence of events. So um, again, this is a pretty um, involved week. We're going to look at some of uh, some of our episodes and we're going to look at NBC, but we're also going to start looking at things like the legacy of the Cosby Show, how the LA riots, even though it was 30 years ago, impact events that are, we are dealing with today. So um, really try to connect those dots in your uh, weekly work this week. And thank you again for your attention as we delve into this complex subject matter. I really appreciate it.